solemnly swear that I will faithfully, diligently, and impartially execute and perform the duties required of me as a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and will well and truly obey and perform all lawful orders and instructions which I shall receive as such. The Queen's Men, for the first time, authentic stories of the world-famous Royal Canadian Mounted Police, tales of men who for almost a hundred years have helped to keep peace in Canada. The Queen's Men. The Queen's Men, true stories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Names have been changed for family protection. And now transcribe The Queen's Men. time of this incident, that part of the force was known as the Northwest Mounted Police. Oh, so it happened in the far north, did it, sir? Yeah. In a tiny outpost at Robin Lake in northern Saskatchewan. The area was largely people with Indians. All friendly by this time, of course, but with its average share of human weakness. Oh, did they speak English? Oh, quite well, some of them. Staff Sergeant Russell was in charge of the small outpost. Just a handful of men. How did it go, sir? Well, it started in a routine way with the report of an argument. An Indian came into the outpost one day and told his story to Sergeant Russell. trouble at this time? Maybe worse trouble soon. Well, what's happened so far? Rodnick. Oh, Rodnick again, eh? What's he up to this time? He used knife. Knife? Did he uh, kill someone? No, but maybe next time, Monty. This time, he take knife and cut up squaw. Is she badly hurt? Hurt bad when he do it, but she okay now. He real mad. And mad at many who tried to stop him. Who tried to stop him? The chief and his own squaw and me. See, Monty, here, my arm. Yes, what a nasty gash. Did he use the knife on the others? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, him use knife on all near him when he get mad. When he plenty mad. He in trouble with chief over stealing. He steals everything he sees. Yes, I know that only too well. Rodnick is a pretty bad Indian, I'm afraid, Gwenko. Mm -hmm. Him plenty bad Indian. Time for him to be locked up in jail, I think, Monty. Huh? You're right about that, Gwenko. Just a minute, Gwenko. Oh, Baker. Yes, Sergeant? We're going to have to find another storage place for the winter canned goods. You mean we're going to have a prisoner, Sergeant? Yes, the uh, Indian Rodnick. I'm going over to camp now to bring him in. He started going berserk with a knife. Well. Wow. So you be clearing out the cell while I'm gone, will you? Gee, we haven't had a prisoner for six months. Uh, we uh, we might not have this one either, Sergeant. How do you mean? You'll have to go awful careful, Sergeant. You know, Indians feel about being locked up. I sure do. I don't have to remind you what a good shot Rodnick is. <laughs> now stop fretting, Baker. I can handle him. We'll be back by supper time.
the reasons for Constable Baker's doubts were understandable. The police always found it difficult to keep Indians in confinement or to take them into custody in the first place. For freedom was their birthright and a deep necessity. They usually lived in harmony with their fellows, and jails had been unknown to them until the advent of the white men who invaded their domain. A troublesome Indian like Rodnick, who caused trouble among his own people, was the exception, and, of course, had to be dealt with according to law, particularly when he began endangering lives. So away went Sergeant Russell, and soon found the Indian scouting about near the edge of the camp and proceeded to arrest him in his quiet, efficient way. There you are, Rodnick. I'm sorry to say I've been hearing some stories about you. Get away, Monty. Not this time, Rodnick. This time you've caused real harm to your people, and I have to arrest you. Now come with me quietly, and I won't put the handcuffs on you. I not come with you. We're going into town, and you'll stay there with us for a while. You'll be warm and well-fed, and no one will be unkind to you. One day you'll be free again, but first you'll have to learn not to harm other people. Now come along, Rodnick. Well, that's a good-looking rifle you've got. You know, if you shoot me, that's when you will get into serious trouble, Rodney. Now put that gun down and come with me quietly. If you try to shoot me, I shoot you first, Mountie. I won't try to shoot you, Rodney. I'm not allowed to shoot you. But I'm going to walk towards you, and I'm going to take that gun away from you. Now, give me that gun. Stop backing away, Rodnick. Stay where you are and give me the... Hey! Come back here! You mean I cleared out the cell for nothing? No, we'll be using it. There's no doubt about that. That Indian's tough, but he can't hold up forever. He beat it, did he? Well, I went after him, but he finally stopped and covered me again with his gun. It's a high-powered 30 30 rifle, and he obviously is ready to use it. It was an amazing thing to see, Baker, the way he kept me covered. And in between times, in sudden, sure gestures, he dug himself a dugout in the frozen ground. Couldn't you have crept up on him? Oh, I kept trying to, but every time I made a move, he swung on me with that rifle. Finally, I just stood back and watched him. He built himself a substantial-looking fort and reinforced it with logs, and there he is, determined to resist arrest with all his might. He's got plenty of that. Yes, he's a powerful man. Stands well over six feet. Uh, he must weigh 200 pounds or more. And the surest marksman I've ever encountered. But, Sergeant, he'll freeze to death in that fort of his. <laughs> Not Rodnick. While I was still there, and after he was safely inside, he began to build himself a cozy fire. Mm. How much ammunition has he got? Well, it's hard to tell. To be frank, I don't think I'll take him until his ammunition runs out. That's if I want a decent chance of surviving, that is. Yeah, the ghost couldn't very well bring him in. Well, I'll take up my position first thing in the morning, and I give you my word I'll stand my ground until I take him. Oh, where's that special supper you're going to cook? I'll eat Rodnick's portion. Huh? <laughs> it seems only fair. You want me to come along with you in the morning? No, you're needed here. I wish we had more men. Three of us could surround them. Well, I guess I'll just have to sit it out. Well, Sergeant Russell sat it out for a long time and nearly got himself frozen into the bargain without coming any closer to taking his prisoner. The Indian was determined to remain in his barricade and to shoot it out rather than allow himself to be arrested. Rodnick was brave and extremely cautious. Also, he was practical. He needed daily supplies of food and ammunition, and he began making daily trips to the Hudson Bay Post, with his rifle always at the ready. And there he got his supplies, and instantly he took up his position again. Russell waited patiently for a slip, but none came. Then one day... Well, we've played this game long enough. What are you going to do, Sergeant? Bring in a cannon? No. Nope. I'm going to make a trip to the detachment for reinforcements. But, man, it's 120 miles. I know that. Help me get the dog team and sled ready, will you? A three-day trip. The moment is on the way down. 
It'll stay between 20 and 40 below the whole time you're gone. Baker, I've got to get that Indian. I can't blast him out, and I don't fancy getting my head blown off. I don't mind taking a chance, but I'm not prepared to walk into a sure thing. I need two more men, and I'm going to get them. Well, as long as you know what an ordeal you're in for. No ranches or settlers between here and the detachment. You'll have to camp out. Well, I've been practically camping out all this week. That's no hardship. But look, I don't want Rodnick going into hiding while I'm gone. So I want you to make a trip out to his fort two or three times a day and stand around the way I've been doing. With your fur cap, and from that distance, you'll think I'm still watching him. And he'll carry on till we get back. Yeah, I'll do that. But I hope you get back. This place could get awful lonely. And so, after making thorough preparations, Sergeant Russell set out by team and dog sled on his trying overland route of 120 miles. It turned out to be a very difficult trip, for he encountered an unbroken trail of deep snow and many times was in danger of losing his bearings. But he was an extremely courageous man, and finally he arrived at his destination. After a hot meal and a change of clothes, he told his story to Inspector Layton. Yes, Sergeant, I think you're doing the right thing. A fellow like that couldn't hold out all winter and then escape you eventually. Oh, I figure he'll get careless one of these days, sir, and then we'll take him. Even with three of us, I'm not counting on walking straight in and taking him. Quite right. Good common sense is more valuable than dramatic courage. I think so, sir. It's common sense that Rodnick lacks, and eventually it'll work in our favor. Well, let's see now. I'll supply you with a fresh team, of course, for your trip back. And I'll assign you Constable Trevor and Teamster McDonald. Now, both these men are good shots and very fast in their feet. Good. And they don't know the meaning of the word fear. I appreciate your help, sir. You better start first thing in the morning. Right, sir. One thing, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Just one order. Take your man alive. There were two reasons for that particular order. One was to spare the expense of a murder charge against a force member, which was the usual procedure in those days when any mounted policeman killed another man during arrest or in self-defense. The other reason was the general force policy of not shooting, and certainly not to kill, except under the most extreme circumstances. The three men had a long, cold trip, and after what seemed an endless period of time, they arrived at the outpost at Robin Lake. Well, I sure am glad to see you made it, Sergeant. Thank you, Baker. Then, uh, this is Constable Baker. Baker, Constable Trevor, and um, Teamster McDonald. Glad, oh, I'm glad to know you, too. It certainly is wonderful to see civilization again. Well, yeah. Constable, that's the first time I've heard this man forsaken spot referred to as civilization. But thanks for the compliment. Yeah, it looks pretty good to me after the last few days. I guess so. Well, I've got coffee on the stove. We'll try and get the chill out of you as fast as we can. Good. Well, uh, Baker, how's our Indian? He's doing great, Sergeant. Just great. Cozy as a bug in a rug. All settled in and prepared to stay forever. Well, he's going to get a real surprise one of these days. Well, what's your plan, Sergeant? Do we walk straight in and take him tomorrow? Well, it's fine talk, Constable, but you don't know this Indian. If we tried any straight walking in, we'd soon be three dead men. Yes, he's got a good clear view on all three sides. He'd pop off ten of us as soon as Wink, too. Nope. I've been giving it some thought on the way back, and I think it's time to use our imaginations. Who's got some imagination? <laughs> I have. Come on, let's have that coffee, and I'll tell you my plan, man. Brought a job for me, Sergeant? Yes. I want two things for tomorrow morning. A supply of cold tea, three Indian suits, and some war paint. In just a moment, we'll return for the second part of this true story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Queen's Men. And now we return you to the Queen's Men. Constable Baker had the orders from his sergeant. And it was a very puzzled Mountie who rounded up the requested equipment. Cold tea, three Indian outfits, and some war paint. Arriving back at the outpost, he watched in fascination as the other three men proceeded to get themselves rigged up as half-breeds. Well, well, well. 
Now, just close that big, fat mouth of yours, Baker, and give me a hand with this stain. Sure thing, Sergeant. All over your face? Yes, and neck, hands, and arms. Now, last time I went through this routine was in a high school play. We used coffee. <laughs> so you're really going to use war paint, Sergeant? I mean, Indians don't go in much for it anymore. Just at parties and celebrations, that's all. We three are going to have a grand celebration, Baker. Right in the middle of the street today, in front of the Hudson Bay Post. Say, I think I get the idea, Sergeant. This is going to take place, sort of just coincidentally, about the time our friend Rodnick hit the trading post. That's right. Yeah. He'll see us drinking this fire water and obviously enjoying ourselves, and if I know Rodnick, he won't be able to resist joining us. <laughs> Rodnick came to the post as usual, with his rifle on his arm, ready for instant use. And as he emerged from the trading post, the three half-breeds came staggering along the street with their bottles of firewater. They caught Rodnick's interest. And as he stood watching, they began to play the fool, and then staged a sham fight. One of the men was knocked down. With difficulty, he regained his footing and began to run unevenly down a trail leading away from the main street. After him went the other two half-breeds. And after them went Rodnick, by this time highly amused by the antics of the three brawlers and especially interested in their firewater. The chase continued until all four were into the bush. And then, suddenly Constable Trevor spun around, whipped out his gun, and had Rodnick covered. Do as he says, Rodnick. I've got him covered from behind. He's running. Will I get him, Sergeant? Shoot over his head. Okay, Rodnick, you've asked for it. Good work, Sergeant. That stopped him. Yeah, where'd you get him, Sergeant? How'd you just nick his leg? That's exactly what you did, too, Sergeant. Just barely grazed him. Uh, you'll be all right, Rodnick. Just lie still and we'll carry you. Got that brandy on you, Trevor? Yeah, I hear him. Thanks. Hey, Rodnick, drink this. Hey, 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 not all at once. Well, men, we did it. How was he, Baker? All the work I did getting that cell nice and cozy for him, and he doesn't appreciate it one bit. Keeps pacing up and down, scowling, constantly tugging at the bars. Yes, there's only one thing an Indian thinks about in jail, and that's getting out of jail. Too bad some of them conduct themselves in such a way they have to be locked up. You were very lenient with that Indian, Sergeant, until he started slashing up his pals. Yes, couldn't let him continue that. Well, you men have a tough job ahead of you taking Rodnick back to the detachment. Yeah, one of us will have to sleep shackled to him, that's certain. Think you can handle him? I'll come along with you if you... Oh, will. no, we can manage. You made that trip twice already. Twice more would really be above and beyond the call of duty. Now, we'll get him back, all right. <laughs> they did, although it was a long and arduous journey. At the outpost, Constable Baker and Sergeant Russell settled once more into their daily routine. But back at the detachment, there began the task of keeping Rodnick in custody. No sooner was the Indian confined after his arrest than he began to make plans for his escape. Malty. Hmm? Yeah? Me feel sick. Oh, come on now. You're not going to try that one again. No, me, me feel sick for real this time. Bad pain. Terrible bad pain. Okay, let's have the details. Where's the pain? Here. There, huh? Here. Inside. You know, Rodnick, one of these days you might really get sick and nobody's going to believe you. Feel sick now. Mounty, get doctor, look at Rodnick. That doctor's sick of running down here to you. Mounty, have to get doctor. Mounty rule. When prisoner is sick, got to get doctor. You know a lot about the Monty's, don't you? Okay, I'll get the doctor. But don't blame me if he wrings your neck one of these days. Hey, can I see you a moment, Inspector? Yes, Doctor. Come in. Yeah, thanks. I've just been down to Rodnick's cell. If that Indian hasn't got an appendix, 
He's a heck of a good actor. Fender's that is, huh? Well, he hasn't tried that one before. Well, I was suspicious of him at first, too. But he responds to all the tests as though he really has it. And I'm afraid I'll have to order him into hospital. <laughs> How do you feel, Rodnick? Oh, bad. Real bad. Well, listen, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I guess I didn't believe you at first, but I've had a ruptured appendix, and I know how much it can hurt. Don't worry, they'll get you fixed up. Whoops! Hang on, Rodnick. It's a bad corner. I guess they're... Hey! Now I get you. Oh! Smart. Very smart. Mounty. <laughs> Smart Indian, too. Somewhere, at his own camp, perhaps, he'd seen someone being examined for appendicitis. And being quick-witted, he'd recorded every reaction of the patient. Therefore, he knew every response and was able to convince the doctor that he really was sick. Riding in apparent pain in the back of the ambulance guarded by Constable Trevor, although there were other guards up front, he waited for the vehicle to swerve. And when it did, he attacked like lightning. After knocking Constable Trevor unconscious, Rodney merely opened the back double doors of the horse-drawn ambulance and jumped. His escape was not discovered for another ten minutes. They revived Constable Trevor and took him back to the detachment. Before long, the inspector's phone rang. Hello? Inspector Layton speaking. Yes, he escaped from... Yes, last night. What's that? Well, what's your name? Where are you? Yes. Yes, I'll send some men out right away. Thank you for phone. Constable Trevor. Yeah, I wish you'd let me join in the hunt, sir. Either that or have headquarters supplies for some new magazine. You're going to join in now, Trevor. For the second time now, you're going to go out and bring that Indian in. And so they did bring him in, and he was equipped with the ball and chain. Everyone heaved a sigh of relief and settled down to routine business. Everyone, that is, but Constable Trevor. What is it you're worried about, Trevor? Oh, I don't trust Rodnick, sir. Ball and chain or no? Several times I've gone past his cell, and every single time he's working away on the lock. With his fingers or any sort of instrument? Oh, just his fingers. I know it sounds impossible, but... I wouldn't feel safe about him if we equipped him with a straitjacket as well. No, well, we can't very well do that. If the ball and chain won't hold him, nothing will. I think you'd better quit worrying, Constable. His trial comes up in a week. We'll see what happens then. Well, something happened before then. Although Rodnick worked ceaselessly on the ball and chain, he couldn't budget. He then took a more practical turn of mind. After sizing up all the routine duties of the guards, he discovered their failings. One guard had become careless when unlocking the ball and chain before exercise hour. Rodnick took advantage of the second of freedom after the unloosening of the ball and chain. A second was all he needed. He made a lightning sprint and leaped over the wall like a deer and was away before a shot could be fired. The alarm was sounded instantly and Constable Trevor sprang into action, taking McDonald along with him. Well, here we are, Mac. Here's where he jumped. I'm lucky for him there's fresh snow. Come on, let's follow these footprints. Well, if the lead into town, we're sunk. There were no footprints there. No, he'd stay away from the town. Now, an Indian doesn't usually make this kind of mistake, but in his desperation to be free, I think he'll stick to the woodlands, and we can follow him every step of the way. <laughs> There. The footprints continue under those low branches and along that path. Trevor, don't you think he'd be a mile away from here? He can run twice as fast as we can. Ordinarily he can, but remember he's been shackled. That should cut out his stamina. Hey, wait a minute. Is you stopping? Yeah, look. But that, that can't be. How can his footprints simply stop like that? Just as if he went up a tree. But there's no tree right here. And yet, this absolutely sudden stopping of... McDonald. Look down there. 
You don't mean where the path falls off. Why, there's a 15-foot drop. You could do it. Then we'd see the footprints continuing down on the lower level. Just the that... same. Let, 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 let's climb down there. There's an old Indian trick I remember. Hmm? Now, don't make a sound. Just follow me. I don't get it. You will, or I miss my guess. Here. Down here. What? Now, hang on to that branch. Hmm? Oh, there's a cave here, huh? No, I don't think so. Now, look for a log completely covered with snow, even underneath. If you see it, pounce on it. Gotcha! Hold him down, Mac! Gotcha there. Okay, Rodwick. We can keep you cool for as long as you like. You come along peaceably, and we'll let you get out of the snow. Smart, Mountie, too smart. Me come. And Trevor's hunch was right. After some scouting about, they found Rodnick rolled up in a blanket of snow. He'd rolled himself over and over in it until he was completely hidden, and then had lain perfectly still. Boy, that's a smart trick. <laughs> yeah. He'd heard the two men closing in on him, and so he'd made the leap and hidden himself and thought he was safe. Well, what became of him? Well, he came up for trial the following week and was convicted, but owing to extenuating circumstances, he drew a light sentence. Apparently, he'd learned his lesson, for once he got out legally, he never gave any more trouble. But great credit was due to the men on that case for their patience and refraining from gunfire. Their orders under the pledge to preserve peace and prevent crime had been fully accomplished. Authentic stories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Music under the direction of Sidney Torch. Script and adaptation under the supervision of John Adaskin. Produced and directed by Harry Allen Towers.